uh, special planning of low carbon cities and machine learning. We will wait another uh, two or three minutes for uh, more folks to join us and then we will start. Okay, let's start. So hi again, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us today. So I'm uh, Nicolas Milojevic Dupont, and I will be uh, I will have the pleasure to be um, hosting and moderating this session. So I'm a PhD student um, at the Technical University in Berlin at the Mercator Research Institute on Global Commons and Climate Change, and I'm also a member of Climate Change AI. Um, I'm a um, content uh, the the chair of the content committee and also the community lead for transportation and building. So the, the topic of today is very close to my heart. Um, so um, the schedule today will be, so I'll uh, give a short introduction. Then we'll have a first uh, talk by Jujan Sao and Tao Tao, um, uh, followed by a first uh, round of uh, Q&As, and then the second um, talk by Mafalda Salva, uh, Silva, and uh, again, some Q&As and joint discussion um, at the end. So uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time at the uh, Climate Change AI uh, event, so we are um, an organization of volunteers uh, who are aiming to catalyze impactful work at the intersection of um, climate change and AI. And um, we, so we are, in, in general, we have a global uh, network of researchers, policymakers, and entrepreneurs, and we are developing uh, various digital resources to, for people who want to enter in this space and uh, work on, on climate change and AI. And so we also do some advice to uh, different relevant stakeholders in um, various uh, events for, for knowledge, knowledge sharing. So for example, for um, digital resources, um, you can go on our website and there are um, summaries of um, different application areas where, uh, where there's been some academic uh, research uh, on uh, using climate change. Uh, uh, so using machine learning for climate change applications. And so I'm very happy to announce actually that uh, this week we are uh, launching um, a, a new uh, a new tool for um, for online resources. So we have a, a wiki um, that you can access uh, with with the link that that's just right here. And so um, you can uh, contribute. So if you want to contribute, uh, please um, read the the wiki guideline for for tips on how to contribute and. Um, uh, yeah, and, and so the, the edits need to be accepted by a moderator. So don't be surprised if the, the edits that, that you're making are not directly visible, but they, they get visible as, as soon as um, a moderator accepts them. And we're actually looking for, um, for moderators. So feel free to reach out if, if you're interested. And so we have a, a Slack group for uh, the, the CCI wiki uh, for, for all this coordination. Um, then we, yeah, we're organizing uh, a bunch of different events, uh, for example, at machine learning conferences. And so there's one coming up very soon uh, at the so workshop at the International Conference, Conference on Machine Learning, ICML. And um, yeah, and this webinar is part of a series of webinar and you can already uh, register for a webinar in July, uh, which is gonna be about um, application of machine learning in, in climate uh, finance. And uh, you can also uh, watch previous webinar uh, online. So um, various different topics. Uh, yeah, and so in, in general, um, there are various ways to um, join the Cl Climate Change AI network. We have a newsletter, a discussion forum, happy hours. So yeah, and just follow us on the um, social uh, medias and, um, and on our website. 
So back to uh, the, the topic of today, um, special planning of uh, low carbon cities with, uh, with machine learning. So just a, just a quick intro uh, in, into the topic um, before we, we start with the presentation. So yeah, so, so cities have a, a key role to play for, for climate change mitigation and adaptation, um, given that most of the, the world population lives in cities. So therefore, uh, most of the, the energy use and, and GHG emissions ultimately are linked to cities, and, and city also, cities also need to become more resilient to uh, future climate impact. And um, yeah, in many cities, the, the quality of life of, in, of inhabitants could be um, substantially improved, to, to say the least. So, um, so the goal of this webinar um, is, to, uh, is to highlight the, the, the fact that actually this challenge of, um, have a lot of, of a lot to do with um, how cities have been planned. Um, which is the way urban infrastructure, so buildings, uh, streets, parks, and, and other type of land uses have been progressively developed, um, often without considering climate change. So the result of, of this is um, that the special structure of cities that's um, often called urban form or urban tissue or urban morphology is, is often structurally not sustainable and, and resilient. So, um, so research is needed to understand why and how specifically um, this is the case and uh, how to um, design solutions um, um, to transform the, the, the special structure of cities uh, in order to make them more sustainable and resilient. So, so today we have the great honor to have um, three speakers uh, who have done a pioneering, pioneering work um, on using machine learning um, to explore the increasingly richer data that's available on, on cities and cities special configuration. So they will share with us um, their approach and their insights on uh, yeah on how to transform cities towards sustainable and resilient futures. Um, so the the first talk today uh, will be given by uh, Dr. Jason Sao and uh, Tao Tao. So um, Dr. Jason Sao is a professor at the M3 School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota, and is internationally well known for his research on uh, residential self selection in the relationships between built environment and travel behavior. Um, so his work has focused, for example, on the nonlinear relationships um, in land use and transportation research, the effect of uh, ICT on travel behavior, and the um, uh, planning and how to plan cities for, for satisfaction of inhabitants. And he is the co-editor-in-chief of Transportation Research Part D. Um, Tao Tao is a PhD candidate um, uh, in urban and regional planning, also at the Humphrey School of uh, public affairs at the University of Minnesota. And so in his work, he applies novel uh, research methods such as machine learning to explore nonlinear interaction between built environment and travel behavior, um, pedestrian and uh, bicycle uh, safety, and the impact of transit on travel behavior. So uh, Jason, uh, Tao, thank you so much again for being with us today and the floor is yours. Oh, okay. thank you very much, uh, Nicola, and bring us into this uh, very interesting webinar theory. And now I'm going to share my screen. And today, and I and my PhD students, Tao Tao, uh, we will talk about a few applications of machine learning approach in the connections uh, between urban form and travel and also the carbon emissions. So in the uh, in nineteen uh, in twenty nineteen, and uh, transportation accounts for about 20, 29 percent of the greenhouse gas emission in the United States. And then from the uh, perspective of passenger transportation, there are at least three ways to reduce the carbon emission. For example, we can improve the uh, fuel efficiency. You know, during the Obama administration, you know, he proposed, you know, he has a regulation, you know, to uh, promote the uh, fuel uh, efficiency to 35 miles per gallon. And also we can reduce the carbon content. So we can use option fuel vehicles, particularly the electric vehicles. So we can reduce the carbon emission. And also we can use, uh, we can reduce the uh, vehicle miles traveled, trying to reduce the travel distance. So in this case, you know, we need to use the travel demand management uh, strategies to address this issue. And then there are many ways to uh, reduce people's travel demand. One of them is we, we can use the urban form because travel is a, uh, uh, 
derived demand from uh, spatially segregated uh, locations. So in that case, we can see the urban form is really the foundation and for the transportation. So in this case, we can use good environment uh, intervention trying to uh, influence people's child behavior. Uh, in terms of the beauty environment intervention, there are many, uh, many ways. For example, we can use urban growth boundary. And then in the United States, you know, we have this smart growth and the eco city and transit around development, pedestrian development, and so on and so forth. So, you know, among all of those strategies, you know, we want to know whether or not they are effective, you know, to address the uh, travel distance and associated with carbon emission. You know, the central question is, how do urban form variables affect travel behavior? So a lot of studies working on this issue, you know, could be hundreds of thousands of papers, and then many of those papers are using the linear regression. So when we use the linear regression, you know, there is a fundamental assumption. We assume the connection between the travel behavior variable and then the beauty environment variable is linear. Right. So the interpretation of the bait in this case is across the entire range of X associated with Y unit increase in X, Y will increase by beta units. So this is kind of the fundamental assumption of the linear regression. And then because this is a very strong assumption, you know, we need to use the residual plot to check whether or not the data follow uh, this kind of the linear uh, assumption. But in reality, you know, this is not the case. So this about this brings about the nonlinear effects. So what is the nonlinear effects? And then here, you know, we I use the uh, definition by uh, Gosser, and then in his 2018 paper, you know, he stated the nonlinear effects refers to the impacts, the size of impact of one variable depends on the value of that variable. So here I use his figure one, so we can see, for example, if we see the line O and F, O and F. So this is more of the curvilinear, right? So more like the contracting firm. We can think about, okay, if we think of the X as the age and Y as the uh, travel frequency, and then when people's age increases and then we can see the number of trips will increase. But when they retire and then they don't have the commuting trips. So that means we can see the trips will decrease. So this is kind of the quadratic relationship between age and then the trip frequency. And also we can have some other form of the nonlinear effects. My example is this threshold effect. Threshold effects means, you know, the effects of one variable on the dependent variable changes dramatically after passing a certain points. For example, here we see the E point. This represents a lower threshold. West X exceeds X prime, we can see the slope of this line increase dramatically. And then also we have another uh, uh, upper slope at this point. So this is kind of some examples of the nonlinear effects. And also, you know, we see, you know, from the transportation behavior theory, you know, we can see some theoretical foundations uh, for uh, the connection, the nonlinear connections between uh, urban form and travel behavior. For example, we know, you know, the travel distance is uh, positively associated with travel time. And then we have very famous uh, a series called travel time budget, you know, so people, we have 24 hours a day, and then we can only allocate a certain amount of time for our travel. You know, based on observation from many cities, we see, you know, people will spend about 60 to 90 minutes for their travel. And then if we want to model the relationship between travel time and distance, you know, if we use a linear regression, and then we will see a linear, co linear connection like this. So that means, you know, when we increase the distance to the city center, and then the travel time will increase uh, continuously. But if I live far away from the city center, so that means, you know, my travel time will be very, very high. But actually, this is not going to be the case, because once I'm living far away from the city center, and then my life is not uh, centered around, around the CBD, and actually, I'm going to choose my local center, and then, you know, to arrange my life. So in this case, you know, yes, we see an increase in terms of the uh, travel time, but after passing a certain uh, uh, distance, and then the changes will be minimal. And in the previous studies, you know, we see uh, uh, many approaches has been used to uh, uh, model this kind of the nonlinear and threshold influence. Uh, for example, you know, we see the uh, piecewise regression. So in this case, we categorize 
categorize X into several dummy variables and then to see the differing effects of those dummy variables. And also we can see some kind of the quadratic function and log linear function, you know, we will model this kind of non-linearship and so on and so forth. And, but you know, when we use this kind of approach to address the non-linearship, you know, we put a strong assumption. Okay, for example, you know, if we see this is a quadratic function and then we assume the, their relationship will follow this uh, quadratic polynomial function exactly. So this is kind of still a very strong assumption. And also, you know, uh, because we have so many uh, urban form variables and then different variables may have different types of nonlinearity with the travel behavior variables. So that means, you know, we see, you know, the nonlinearship is not regular. And then if we are using this kind of predefined relationship to model them, actually it's going to be inefficient because we have to guess what are the potential connection between variables. And then, so because of all of those constraints, you know, we are really looking for some ways, you know, to uh, uh, address this nonlinear relationship between urban form variables and travel behavior. Now, I'm going to turn uh, the microphone to Tao. Uh, so thanks, Jason. Um, so actually there are several types of machine learning approaches. Uh, so we have tree-based uh, machine learning approaches, including random forest, XGBoost, gradient boosting decision trees. Those tree-based models are pretty popular in, uh, in addressing structured problems. So in structured problems, we need to deal with tabular data, which means the data has uh, the data are the data are structured into rows, and each row contains information about something. Uh, we also have neural network models that are very popular for unstructured problems. For example, images, texts, and uh, sounds. Um, there are also some other models such as multi vector machines. K nearest neighbors, etc. Next, please. Um, so this approach, the approach applied in today's, so we're introduced two cases in today's lecture, and the approach applied in those two cases is gradient boosting decision tree. It is a tree based model. It has pretty good prediction performance and can better handle missing values and outliers especially because it has relative weak predefined assumption about the relationship between dependent and independent variables. Um, so it can examine the non irregular nonlinear relationships. Um, so the results produced by GPDT can, uh, can be relative importance and the partial dependence plots. This method also have some limitations. Um, so it cannot provide p-values um, it is subject to the issue of overfitting and it has high learning and uh, computation cost. Next, please. Uh, I will brief briefly introduce the mechanism of uh, gradient boosting decision tree. So as its name shows, this method is a combination of two approach, the gradient boosting and the decision trees. So decision tree uses a tree-like structure to categorize the training sample into several subsamples or leaves based on some criteria. Uh, the toy example in the left figure uses a decision tree to split the sample into four subsamples based on, su based on three criteria, whether or not X, X1 is smaller than M, whether or not X2 is smaller than two, then X2 is smaller than T, and whether or not X2 is smaller than Q. Then we can use average of subsamples to predict the case with the similar values of X1 and X2. The figure in the right uses Cartesian system to show the distribution of the four subsamples. Next, please. Um, so, but um, one tree usually cannot have a very good performance because it is too simple. So that's why we use gradient boosting to address this problem. The gradient boosting approach can create new trees based on the results of old trees. By adding more trees, the full model will keep having smaller loss of the information and a better performance. Next, please. Um, so we use the GBM package in R 
to realize this method and uh, generate relative importance and a partial dependence plot. Relative importance shows how much one independent variable contributes to reducing variance of the dependent variables. Um, the left figure is a part of a decision tree. It uh, splits the sample based on X1. We can calculate the variance for the full sample and the two subsamples, which is variance one, variance two, and variance three. Then we can calculate the variance reduction through variance one minus the sum of variance two and the variance three. This variance reduction can be treated as the contribution of X1. Finally, we can calculate the total variance reduction in the whole tree and how much proportion of it is contributed by each independent variable. The proportion is relative importance. It is shown as percentage point, and the sum of the relative importance of all independent variables is 100%. The partial dependence plot shows the uh, effects one independent variables have on the predicted outcome, just as shown in the right figure. Um, so that's a brief introduction of our method. Thank you, Tao. And now uh, I'm going to introduce the first case study. And in this study, using the gradient boosting decision trees to examine the nonlinear relationships between the building environment and uh, uh, driving distance in Oslo. And as far as we know, you know, this is uh, one of the first application of the machine learning approach in the land use and travel behavior research. So here I'm going to talk about the rationale for this study. You know, as we know, you know the uh, metropolitan areas has uh, transformed from the uh, model-centric uh, region to polycentric area, and also many scholars believe you know this polycentric urban form is conducive to a low carbon travel. And uh, you know we need to test whether or, not, whether or not this is true. And then you know many scholars trying to uh, figure this out. And then you know we collect the data, and then we use the uh, uh, either the carbon emission or the VMT as a dependent variable. And then we include the independent variables. And uh, for example, we have the distance to city center, distance to regional center, and distance to local center. And then we run regression. When very often you will see you know. The, uh, the variable of distance to city center is significant, but for the other two distance variables, they are not significant. And then the implication is actually only the distance to city center. So that means location of your home to the regional, to the region is very important, but the regional center and local center, they do not have the influence on people's travel and then associated with, uh, associated with the carbon emissions. But I don't think this makes sense, right? So for example, you know, my colleague, Peter Nice, you know, he proposed, you know, this kind of theory for people's activity location. You know, people making choice of the active location based on two criteria. One is the best facility and the other one is the proximity. For example, you know, if I want to uh, watch a major league uh, 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 a baseball game, you know, apparently, you know, I need to go to the city center because that's the place of the stadium located, right? So, you know, that's the best facility for this kind of uh, 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 service. And then if I just want to watch a minor league or maybe just kind of a, a, a game of the high school students, you know, there is no reason for me to go to the city center to watch the high school student there, right? So I can just go to my local school and then they have a place, right? So in this case, because, you know, the, uh, the service itself is not that special, it's not unique, right? So in this case, the proximity become a very important factor for my travel decision. So that means, you know, we think both the regional location and also my local centers will pl play a role in my behavior. And then we collect the data in the Oslo and then, you know, we have the driving distance as the dependent variable. And then we have the demographic attributes, the building environment attributes as the independent variable. And then we use the GBDD approach to run this uh, data. And then we come up with the relative importance 
And then again, you know, the relative importance of our variables will at the gather will be 100%. And now let's look at the distance to city center. So you can see this variable is the most important variables among our variables. It accounts for about 18% of the predictive power for driving distance. Yes, so that's, you know, this is correct. You know, distance to city center is the most important variable. But also, you know, the distance to local center and also distance to second order center, you know, they are also important, right? So each of them account for about 10% of the predictive power. If we add them together, actually, they are more important than the, uh, then the region, uh, then the, the, the city center, right? So in this case, you know, when we use the GBD, GBDT approach, you know, we illustrate this kind of the whole picture among these three very, very important variables. And also, you know, if we look at the distance to city center, so this is the most important variable, and then the population density, this is the next beauty environment variables that are important to people's driving distance. And actually this information tells us the priority of land use policies. Because you know, we have a limited resource to change our beauty environment, and then we can have so many things to change, and then which one is more effective than others. So this research tells us, you know, first one, you know, if we have we can control the uh, sprawling development, we can have a boundary that's going to be very helpful. And also if we densify those areas, that's going to be helpful as well. And also, if we look at you know this model again, you know if we add the relative importance of all beauty environment variables together, and then actually they are about fifty seven percent. So they are more important than demographic attributes. And this one shows the efficacy of using land use policies to change people's behavior and also associated with carbon emission. So this is kind of different from the existing understanding. You know, the existing understanding is that demographic attributes play a more important role in uh, affecting people's behavior than the building environment variables. And then the third, you know, this model also shows us, you know, the variables have the nonlinear and threshold effects with the driving distance. If we use a linear regression, apparently that's going to give us the best estimate. So the GBDT model, you know, produced unbiased estimates. And here I can show you the partial dependence plus. For example, you know, if you see the left figure, the X variable is distant to the center and then the Y variable is predicted uh, driving distance. And then in general, you know, as the distance to city center increases and then the uh, driving distance increases as well. But if you look at, you know, the first segment from zero to 12 kilometers, even though this is increasing, but the slope is relatively flat, flatter compared to the rest. So that means, you know, if we want to control uh, uh, the uh, VMT, the driving distance, you know, is better, we can set our development boundary close to 12 kilometers. And then if you look at the middle figure, we see kind of similar phenomenon, right? So we see a positive relationship between the distance and then the driving distance. And, but within eight kilometers from the second outer center, we see the slope is smaller. And then for the distance to local center, and then that's within four kilometers, we see a smaller increase compared to the rest of the distance. And then from here, you know, we have this threshold effects that tells us the effective range of our beauty environment uh, uh, interventions. You know, this is very important because, you know, the Oslo has an ambitious goal, you know, trying to uh, achieve the zero carbon uh, uh, growth, you know, by 2050. So that means, you know, because we see, you know, population growth in the city, well, the region of Oslo, but if we want to achieve this goal, and then we really need to have some progressive policy, you know, to control the carbon emission. So what we can do, and then based on this research, we can see, you know, for the future development, you know, is better, we can densify the area within 12 kilometers of the city center, eight kilometers of second auto center, and four kilometers of local center. So in this case, we can effectively, effectively control for the driving distance and then mitigate the carbon emission. So case two is a study that uh, examined the, building the influence of building environments on travel related carbon dioxide emissions uh, in the Twin Cities area of the, uh, in the US. 
Um, so the data we used is the travel behavior data collected by Dynamica, which is a smartphone application. Uh, we have 400 respondents in the Twin Cities era. And uh, for each respondent, we collected a one week travel data. Next, please. Next, please, yeah. Um, so we calculated the carbon dioxide emission based on travel distance, travel mode, and the corresponding carbon dioxide emission per passenger mile. So finally, we will have average daily carbon dioxide emission for each respondent as our dependent variables, uh, as our dependent variable. We have two types of independent variables, which are building environment variables and uh, demographics. Uh, the first part of the results is relative importance. We have two tables here. The first table shows the collective relative importance for building environment and uh, demographics. Uh, we found that collectively building environment variables have a larger relative importance than uh, demographics, which means building environment variables contribute more to influence people's daily carbon dioxide emission than demographics. And then the second table shows the relative importance for each independent variables in the type of building environment. Uh, so the most three important variables are land use entropy index uh, with a relative importance of 18.4%, drop density with a relative importance of 7.5%, and uh, distance to downtown Minneapolis uh, with a relative importance of 6.9%. Next, please. The second part of the result is partial dependence plot, which shows the relationship between dependent and independent variables. The left figure shows a partial dependence plot for land use entropy, which is the most important uh, build, environment, build environment variables. As a diversity indicator, land use entropy index is negatively correlated with carbon dioxide emissions. When entropy is smaller than 0.4, uh, it has a travel influence on carbon dioxide emissions. When entropy is from 0.4 to 0.7, carbon dioxide emissions decrease by about five pounds per day. When the entropy is larger than 0.7, land use divert diversity has no additional effect. Uh, the right figure shows a partial dependence plot for drop density within the range of 10 drops per acre. Uh, drop density is negatively associated with carbon dioxide emissions. After that, its marginal effect becomes trivial. Next, please. Um, the left plot shows a partial dependence plot for distance to downtown Minneapolis. Uh, Minneapolis is the primary center in the Twin Cities area. When the distance is smaller than 12 miles, uh, its increasing slope is relatively big. However, when it exists 12 miles, its slope decreases substantially. Living close to the primary center offers people higher accessibility and more, more choice alternatives to driving. Thus, it will lower people's carbon dioxide emissions. By contrast, when people live farther from city center, they tend to reduce train they use and drive longer distance to reach their destinations. Uh, we can see there is also a diminishing return for this trend. Another important type of building environment variable is transit. The right figure shows a partial dependence plot for the distance to narrowest, narrowest transit stop. Within a narrow range, distance to the narrowest transit stop is positively associated with carbon dioxide emissions. In particular, as distance grows from zero to approximately one mile, carbon dioxide emissions increase nearly, linear, uh, linearly. Beyond one mile, the impact of carbon dioxide emissions uh, becomes stable. Next, please. So we have a couple of implications from this study. First is that the building environment variables collectively have a larger influence than demographics. 
actually it is a challenge to the traditional urban planning uh, travel behavior study, which showed that uh, demographics has a larger influence uh, than build environment on people's travel behavior. Uh, we also have some strategies for reducing carbon dioxide. The first is compact development. Specifically, we can increase land use mix and uh, job density within 12 miles from downtown Minneapolis based on the results. And uh, we can also increase density and diversity near transit networks because studies show that when people live close to transit stops, their daily carbon dioxide tend to decrease. So that's all for case two. Thank you, Tao. And, uh, you know, I have been studying the land use and travel behavior for uh, about two decades. And then also I have struggled for uh, with kind of the nonlinear shape and also my inability, you know, trying to model them uh, efficiently. And then the recent development of machine learning approach opened the door for me, actually, you know, offer some new insights into the connections between the urban form and travel behavior and carbon emissions. You know, the recent research have challenged the conventional wisdom. For example, you know, our first case study shows, you know, the relative importance of different centers. And, you know, in the previous research, you know, when we use the linear regression, we find out, you know, only the city center is the most important and then the other centers are not that important. And then based on this research, actually, you know, all centers are very important, even though the city center is still the most important. So that means, you know, the approach you are chosen matters to the results. And also, you know, another, you know, for both studies, we find out, you know, the building environment variables will have more important influence than the demographic variables. So this is also, you know, uh, different from the uh, conventional understanding about the relative importance of building environment variables and demographic attributes. And second, you know, uh, th those studies, you know, offer some evidence regarding the thresholds of independent variables. Again, you know, uh, we have limited uh, results and then we want to choose the most important variable and also we want to choose the most effective range. Because, you know, once we exceed that range, you know, maybe, you know, the outcome is counter uh, productive. So we can use this range to design our planning guideline. For example, if we want to promote, you know, the carbon emission and then uh, reduce the carbon emission, you know, we can say, you know, at least the job density should be 10 percent per acre. So in this case, you know, we can achieve a better result. And even though during the last uh, several years, you know, we have seen a growing number of studies, you know, trying to address the connections between the beauty environment and travel behavior in a nonlinear way, but still compared to the pool of these uh, land use and travel behavior studies, you know, they are still kind of at the infant stage. You know, definitely, you know, we want to see more studies along this line, and then also the studies from different regions and then uh, different sizes of the metropolitan area and different matters of the uh, of the variables. So in that case, we can have uh, adequate evidence, you know, we can uh, enable scholars to do math analysis and to see whether or not we can generalize the results to other metropolitan area. And uh, this slide concludes our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Jason and Tao. Um, yeah, so uh, feel free everyone to uh, uh, to write questions in the chat uh, that we can um, that I can then uh, read um, and yeah uh, maybe while uh, questions are coming in um, maybe I, I can ask a, que a first question uh, building on your uh, conclusion Jason um, so on like challenging the, the conventional wisdom in, in urban uh, planning theory and so um, yeah, we have a lot of case studies uh, for, for specific cities and um, in the past there's been a lot of linear models and often also relatively little data. So I want to ask like, uh, how confident do you think we can we can be about the empirical basis that, that we have for uh, urban travel theory? So for example, the, the primary role of um, distance to, to city center. And so uh, how much do you feel like this, this probably generalized across the world or specific to certain regions? and uh, what what do you think can be the next steps for research um, to to address this kind of question? Like, is it using uh, new data, some doing some reanalysis of of uh, previous studies uh, with, with new methods, or doing some city typologies? Um, yeah. So, in terms of how confident 
you know, first I want to say, you know, the, for example, the importance of the uh, city, of the centers, different centers, you know, it's based on the theory, you know, we think all centers are important because they serve different functions, but because of our inability to modeling them correctly, and then we come up with the false conclusion. And then because, you know, now we can use a machine learning approach and to make prediction, and then we find actually, you know, all centers are very important for people's behavior and also for carbon emission. So I think, you know, this is consistent with our theory. And then, so from this perspective, I think I'm confident, you know, if we have another research trying to address different centers, I think they will have kind of similar results. But in terms of the, what's the effective uh, of range of the distance. This one can vary by the context. For example, you know, if we have a very big city with, uh, you know, uh, 12 million people and compared to another city with 200,000 people, apparently, you know, the, uh, the, the, the effective range of that variable could be different. And also the relative importance of different centers can vary. Right, so that's the reason you know we, I want to see more studies along this line. So in that case, you know we can see whether or not you know our result is really just kind of the type of my error, or this is something we can generalize. But apparently, you know we need more studies, and then so I just have a rough count about you know the studies. You know this is incomplete list. I think so far maybe we can have we have about you know maybe 20 something studies using the machine learning approach to address the non-linear shape between the beauty environment and child behavior. And here, when we say child behavior, we can have different kinds of marrow child behavior. So that means, you know, if we just think about the uh, VMT or think about the carbon emission, you know, we have way fewer studies. So compared to hundreds of thousands of studies since 1990s of land use and child behavior, definitely, you know, we, we, we want to see more studies. So in that case, we can see whether or not we can general, generalize results, you know, from one region to the other region. Thanks. Uh, I think we have a couple of questions uh, on COVID. So um, what, what are your thoughts on, on all um, more pushing to uh, work from home following the, the pandemic might, might change the, the, the commute center away from, from, from cities and yeah, like, yeah, and another question I think that is pretty much related, like, or um, how do you think COVID-19 uh, impact the, the, the different patterns uh, at the moment and, and maybe like the, the longer term impact? Um, and Tao, maybe you can try to choose a question to respond. Um, so I think for the COVID, uh, it's a very, so it's, I think it's very complex because uh, it might influence uh, some people that they can work from home, right? But it also influences some people they cannot work from home. And uh, on the other side, it will also influence some freight uh, from from some freight trips. So, for example, the delivery trips, right? So, all those things can have a very complex uh, influence on COVID, uh, uh, influence on people's travel behavior during COVID. So, to me, it's really hard to say. <laughs> And in terms of the last question, the comparison of that European cities and then spread North American development, you know, because this is still at the early stage. So that means we don't have a kind of comparative study, you know, for this kind of analysis. But I think this is a very good point. And, but, you know, from our analysis, for example, you know, uh, we used data from Oslo and we found out, you know, distant to city center, that 12 kilometers, that's kind of threshold for Oslo. But when we think about Minneapolis, we think, you know, the 12 miles. So you can see, you know, this is 1.6 times the difference in terms of the threshold. So this may provide some uh, uh, implies, you know, the North American cities tend to have a larger boundary because of this sprawling development. And uh, so actually this is not efficient. You know, we want to have a smaller boundary. So in that case, we can concentrate development in certain area and then we can have a larger impact on the carbon reduction. So, but I think this is something definitely, you know, I hope to see more studies and then I can see whether or not we can generalize the results. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, we still have time to for questions, so don't hesitate to, to write some more questions in, in the chat. Uh, we have some some other questions from uh, that were um, asked by, by people before the, the, the talk, actually. So one question is, um, 
um, well, uh, um, how much um, potential do you see for for using these uh, these different approaches and special planning in general to uh, to map um, health data and the the, the health implication of uh, of different um, uh, yeah city planning uh, options? What about the, the health dimension? Uh, I didn't really get your question. What kind of data? Now, the, uh, the, to which extent um, the, these kind of approaches and uh, can also be relevant uh, for health questions? For health questions? So, so for, for, uh, for health, so for... Uh, oh, uh, yeah, you know, think about the machine learning approach. We learned this one from the transportation engineer. So, you know, even we say that Dean and 2018, that paper, you know, as far as I know, that's the first application in the land use and child behavior, but it's not really the first study in transportation because the researchers have used the machine learning approach to study uh, transportation safety and then some other kind of the uh, transportation engineering issues. So that means, you know, we can see, you know, the uh, masters moving from other field to transportation and then from transportation to transportation planning to urban planning. And apparently, you know, we also see some studies, for example, I and a study from the uh, geography, you know, we did a study trying to understand the connection between the beauty environment and then people's health. So we talk about the, the body weight. So I think this is relevant. So that means, you know, thinking about the machine learning, this is the tools, right? The tools can be used in many fields, as long as you have a good theory and then have a good question, you know, can make the nonlinear and threshold association plausible, you should try it. And then you may find some new results compared to the existing analysis. Fantastic. Yeah, so uh, definitely lots of... Uh great idea to push forward. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, oh, we actually have a, another question here, maybe before going to the next uh, talk. So um, question is, uh, uh, you are uh, interpreting models to make a conclusion about causality. And uh, this is a, a greater starting point, but interpretive, uh, interpretability methods such as uh, partial uh, dependence plot of limitation. Um, have you considered looking at causal inference techniques? Uh, first, you know, in terms of the causal inference, you know, there's three criteria, right? Association and then nice-versiness and time-versiness. If we are using the uh, cross-sectional data, and then we can adopt some techniques to uh, trying to uh, have a stronger inference about the causality, but it's going to be very difficult to establish causality. So that means if you're using cross-sectional data, more or less, your, your result is about association, not about the cause, causality. And, uh, you know, so that means it's really about, you know, about the research design. Yeah. So this kind of the uh, post hoc statistical analysis, for example, we can use instrument variables and then we can control for some other variables that may help the causal inference. But, you know, I think the longitudinal study are still very important, you know, to make this kind of causal inference. And then if we have the, causal, uh, the longitudinal, longitudinal data, and then, you know, I think, you know, the machine learning approach will have, you know, will become a powerful tool to address the causal issue. And Tao, do you have any addition? Yeah, I agree with you. So for causality, it is important. The most important part is research design. So if you have a good research design, for example, you have pre and post uh, data and you also have control and treatment group, and then you can draw causality with any approach. Uh, but if you only have uh, longitudinal data, but do not have a good uh, tr treatment and control group, and then it is still hard to, do, to draw causality. Uh, and uh, currently there are definitely some good machine learning approach so that if you have a good research design and that approach can better uh, discover the causality. I think, uh, I can't remember the name, uh, a group uh, from Stanford, they have developed a machine learning approach that can help to uh, draw causality from the data if the research design is pretty good. Great, thanks a lot. Um, so let's uh, actually switch now to the second presentation. Uh, and uh, we, uh, um, no, oops.
have um, works uh, have uh, Mafala Silva, who's going to um, also tell us more on uh, how AI can uh, support low carbon um, uh, urban forms. And so uh, Dr. Mafala Silva has a background in uh, urban metabolism research and um, and on decision support approaches uh, in, in urban planning with a strong focus on uh, urban morphology using GIS. And so she holds a PhD in sustainable uh, energy system from the University of Porto in Portugal, where she was part, part of the MIT Portugal program. Uh, during her PhD, she developed a methodology based on machine learning to estimate um, the, 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 the energy demand of, of uh, an urban area based on its uh, urban form characteristics and and she has been working at the internal, International uh, uh, Energy Agency since uh, 2017, where her work was mainly focusing on, on energy efficiency. And she is recently back in academia at uh, Energy in, in Portugal. So uh, thank you for being with us today, Mafalda, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Nicola, for inviting. Let me try to share my screen. Can you see my presentation? Not yet. Is it showing you already? No. I uh, don't think so. It's not on my screen. Mm. No, it, no, it's good. It's good? Yeah. OK. All right. So thanks for, uh, for the invitation. And uh, the work I will be presenting here today, it's uh, part of my PhD work. Um, so as you mentioned, I, I started working on something else after 2017. And uh, I think this is the first time I presented again uh, since then. So it's been a while. Um, so my PhD work was about the relationship between urban form and energy demand and um, tried, tried to, to model that relationship. Uh, and I will uh, present more details later on. First of all, a little bit of background on the motivation. So why did I uh, focus on cities? Uh, because uh, as you mentioned uh, in the beginning, because that's where people live. In fact, over uh, half of the world population are currently living in cities. They are also where people work. They are the stage of political power. They are the cradle of innovation and drivers of economic development. Cities account for two thirds of world's energy use, roughly, and a little bit above 70% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Another important aspect about cities is that urban infrastructure and the building stock has a large permanence in time. So the decisions that we make today, in fact, will probably uh, significantly impact energy consumption in many years to come. And the reason why I focused on urban form was because I see urban form really as the skeleton of the city. So of course, if you try to address issues over a new skeleton, you will probably be less efficient or, or less effective. Uh, so urban form being the base of, of urban areas, uh, that's where I thought it would be worth, uh, worthwhile acting. Uh, a few bottlenecks and goals of the research. So back then um, I saw research on urban form and energy was still largely sectorial. So either focusing on buildings or transport in isolation. Um, despite there are many attributes of urban form, uh, I thought that there were few factors analyzed at the time. Um, so we see very frequently studies either focusing on density or diversity of the built environment, but few address all the aspects of urban form uh, as a, a complete and comprehensive set. And special explicit studies were still lacking. Uh, I know things are improving a little bit since then. So uh, GIS uh, has been increasingly um, uh, fashion, uh, let's say, and popular since then, but I think there's still room to, to continue using specially explicit studies because of the, um, the benefits they bring. Um, the goals of the research were to identify the main urban form features with energy relevance, 
um, to model buildings and transport sectors together. And this was because literature had been hinting that there could be important trade-offs between the, the two sectors. And so, um, of course, if they are modeled in isolation, we may be missing important, uh, important relationships. Um, to evaluate the effect of urban form as a whole, and then also to try to identify the effect of each of the different urban form variables. Uh, and finally, to identify suitable urban development pathways. So from the modeling, try to, to bring some insights into urban planning. So um, very briefly, this is um, the conceptual model of the research itself. Uh, a key message here today is that it also involves a strategic level that I will not address uh, because there is lack of time and it's less related with the topic of this talk. Um, but on the physical level, so urban form is seen as a set of many variables, as I mentioned, belonging both to the built environment and transport networks. Um, and within the built environment, it was considered that two main energy and uses uh, would be affected, heating and cooling. Uh, and we could also consider lighting, uh, but at the time the data availability for lighting was very limited, um, and so it was uh, could not be included in the research. Then, of course, transport networks influence in mobility patterns and the impact on the overall urban energy demand. Um, so the initial approach was, of course, to perform a comprehensive literature review, and this review was published in case there is interest, uh, please have a look at it, um, because there's a wealth of work already in the field of urban form and energy demand. So basically, uh, there was no need for me to invent the wheel again. I just tried to compile and structure the different attributes of urban form that could be affected, that could affect energy demand. Um, and so you see the list there on the second column in this chart. Um, and then both attributes from the built environment and transport networks could both affect, uh, so they could interact among each other and they could impact specific outcome factors that would then translate into the urban energy service being analyzed. Um, then a second stage was after the identification of the attributes um, was to try and measure them. So um, for instance, density can mean something to me and can mean something completely different to someone else. Um, so the challenge here was to come up with the suitable indicators that would try to uh, describe the urban environment in a comprehensive way and that would measure the different urban configurations possible. So uh, the indicators were very important. They also uh, were identified based on the literature. And uh, just to show an example, for example, density, uh, three, de three indicators for density were considered, whereas, uh, sorry, this moved uh, by itself. Uh, whereas for, for example, for diversity, only one indicator was considered. The same happened for the urban networks, so I will not go into detail on each of the indicators and the metrics considered for the for the modeling process, but just to give a, a sense of what were the variables included. Then the methodology itself, as I mentioned, the definition of the indicators took place at the conceptual level, based on literature, and then at an operational level, uh, the modeling the modeling approach took place. So initially, there was a database preparation, of course, with um, first a data collection and then trying to put the data into a format that could be workable for me. Uh, all of the work uh, was done and grounded in a spatial analysis, so in GIS. Um, I, I thought it would be important to translate both the, the variables considered into the territory as well as the energy consumption patterns. Then the metrics measured from urban form were extracted from the GIS input into the modeling process. The modeling was the model took place and was run and then the knowledge discovery, which is just a general expression from the, the data mining field. Uh, I consider two case studies in Portugal, so the two largest uh, cities um, in the country, Porto and Lisbon. 
From the spatial analysis, I have I bring here today an example of the kind of resolution that I considered. So of course I, I used uh, different geo re geo reference data sets like the buildings, like the transport network itself, etc. But then my unit of analysis was the urban block uh, because uh, at least in these case studies, the urban block was considered to be a relatively homogeneous unit of analysis that we could consider for the modeling process. Um, this is just an example of an indicator for density. For instance, um, in the case of Porto, 1,800 blocks were, were considered, and in the case of Lisbon, 3,400 3, blocks were considered. Uh, then the, other, the energy demand side was also, um, was also mapped. Uh, the data uh, base uh, that I used was the database from the building certification scheme. Um, for heating and cooling. So this gave me the theoretical needs uh, of energy use for heating and cooling based on the building characteristics and the equipment. Um, and uh, so though that database was then translated into the territory as it was geo-referenced. And in the case of transport, I used the local um, transport models used by, by the municipalities that are based, of course, in, um, in traffic countings and, uh, and uh, are relatively accurate for, and calibrated for, um, for these case studies. Uh, for the modeling, uh, I tried different techniques. So I try to, well, of course, this is a complex model with many variables, but uh, trying to move from the simplest technique into the more complex one. So I tried multiple linear regression as a first approach, um, build, basically building a, a model for each of the um, dependent variables. Then um, also tested structural equation models, um, and then finally neural networks. Um, and of course, neural networks um, are known for, for their prediction power, and they were in fact the, the, the modeling approach with the best results. Um, and by best results, I mean the largest R square identified. So in the case of Porto, I got um, uh, an R square of 0.78. Uh, the errors were also the lowest obtained, and um, the rela the relationships for the different variables. Well, in the case of heating, um, the, for the case of heating. It was the, the variable with the largest um, R square, so the one where the relationships of urban form influencing energy demand were found to be stronger. Cooling was consistently the one with the weakest uh, links and mobility in the, um, in the main. Then we, we also know that the neural networks are typically criticized for being black box models, and so I, I, for me, it would not be enough to have the overall influence of urban form because I wanted to understand the impact of the different variables considered. And so I dig into the literature and I found the Garson's algorithm. Uh, so the Garson's algorithm allows to, to estimate the relative importance of the different uh, independent variables. And uh, they are, they are uh, listed here in this graph. For example, you see F is the number of floors. It's uh, in the case of Porto, the variable that has the largest explanatory power. And uh, diversity, uh, DVACT PT, it's the accessibility by public transport, which is the one with the lowest, um, the lowest weight. Um, here, the star diagram is just another way of representing the results. So uh, it's just comparing the, the results from Porto and Lisbon. And this happens because, of course, we cannot expect that uh, the variables of urban form would have the same impact in different urban contexts. Um, maybe it's also an important remark to make is that urban form, of course, it's one of the uh, drivers of energy consumption, but it's not the only one. Uh, so, of course, uh, we can neither expect that urban form uh, effect is the same in different cities. 
So in the future, in fact, it would be uh, I would be very interested uh, if if there would be time to explore a little bit more of these results, try to come up with topologies of, of urban areas that that influence energy demand, and try to understand those topologies. So. Um, Based on the application of this morphological framework, uh, I think this was really a pioneer application of um, machine learning to the field of urban form and energy by then. Um, and it, com it combined the advantages of a high resolution spatial approach uh, with the prediction power of machine learning and neural networks more specifically. Uh, it confirmed the existence of significant links between urban form and energy demand, as um, we were expecting uh, due to the previous work from the literature. But not only that, but it also allowed characterizing the links in a comprehensive uh, way and quantifying them. So from there, um, I moved into trying to use the model to assess different urban development pathways. So suitable urban development pathways for the case studies in, in, in this case. Um, and so I just uh, considered, you know, well-known development approaches and, and um, um, let's say models from the literature as well. Uh, I think they may be familiar to most uh, of the people attending. So infield development, consolidated development, modern development, multifamily housing, transit-oriented development, and green infrastructure. And all of the alternatives considered were compared with the, with the base case, the base case being a no strategy development. So just random development patterns across the city, um, building no matter where. Uh, in addition to these, um, two development magnitudes were also tested. So one shorter term, one shorter term development magnitude uh, with a, a smaller amount of cross floor area built, and then a longer term, um, a longer term uh, scenario with a, a larger amount of cross floor area built. And then two scenario lines, one where uh, I would consider 100% of, uh, of course, this is a topical, but 100% of uh, residential floor area, new residential floor area. And then uh, another scenario line with a mix of 80 to 20% between residential and non-residential. Uh, Maybe important to say that all the development uh, alternatives considered uh, should, they, they were designed in a way that they, they would be comparable. And so the, the floor area to be built was the same in all of them. And so this is just another scheme showing for the different development magnitudes and uh, the different scenario lines, the kind of alternatives considered from those presented uh, just in the previous slide. Um, here in this slide, we can see again, just to show the visualization part the, that always um, was present in this study uh, and the location of the different alternatives in the territory. So this is the case of Porto, just for, for illustration. And then the assessment of the alternatives. Um, I will not go into detail again, but probably maybe worth mentioning that the transit oriented development and the consolidated development under the, um, the longer time span were those that retrieved the largest energy savings and hence those that have the largest um, climate change mitigation potential um, in time. So these then of course felt uh, fed the um, the strategic dimension that I presented earlier, and that would involve identifying uh, policy mechanisms uh, for, for planning. So just to conclude, uh, some, some outcomes of this work, uh, it was found that it's possible to predict the impact of different urban forms and energy demand. Neural networks proved to be a suitable modern technique with a significant potential in the field. Um, so hopefully they will be further explored with different applications. Uh, urban form significantly affects energy demand. So for the case studies at stake uh, with an exponentiary power between 56 and 78%. Uh, 
um, with space heating and mobility being the the uses or the energy services with the uh, with the highest um, on which there is the highest impact. Um, maybe just worth mentioning the the high explanatory power, of course, has to do with the fact that for buildings. Um, the building certificates were used, which have to do with theoretical energy needs. So if data was available in terms of actual energy consumption, real energy consumption, which is also influenced by behavioral aspects, by economic aspects, etc., uh, I would expect that the explanatory power would, would be smaller, but this would have to be tested uh, with, with new data becoming available, for instance, from smart meters, etc. The macro attributes of urban form are the most influential, so no wonder, of course, these are the most explored in the literature uh, at the moment, such as density, granularity, accessibility, and centrality. But of course, micro attributes altogether, and there, there are quite a few, should not be neglected because their impact is not neglectable. Planning for the location and characteristics of future developments may lead to improved energy performances versus just random development patterns with no specific um, strategy behind. And uh, this methodological framework uh, seems to work as an early stage decision support tool to assess the energy impact of urban development choices and suitable for informing future development strategies. So I leave you here a few references of uh, work published uh, from this um, from this PhD. And thank you very much. Uh, I leave my email as well, should you uh, wish to be in touch or further explore any questions related to this work. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mafalda, for the great uh, work and presentation. Um, so we already have a few questions in the chat. Um, actually, the first one relates to, to your point in the conclusion on the, the macro versus uh, micro effect. And so uh, is asking if you have tried out um, alternative resolution next, next to the block level. Um, and if yes, if, if you um, if, if, if that affected the, the, the modeling results or in general, if, if you have some some ideas around that. I did not test, so I thought very well what would be the suitable um, the suitable scale of analysis, and because I was um, trying to combine both buildings and urban networks together, um, for instance, working at the building level would probably be too much resolution because then it would not capture the interactions on the on the transport side as well. So um, I thought very well about that. I also uh, branded the decision on the literature. And uh, the, the urban block seemed to be the one uh, where, it, where it made more sense to, to make this work. So I didn't test it. Great. Um, next, we have a, a more technical questions on, on the uh, Garnsel's uh, method, uh, asking whether uh, this method is specific to, to machine learning and uh, could, uh, could also some, some other indices like the Sobol uh, uh, indices be applied and um, do you know um, if and how they could uh, be compared? Um, yeah. Can you please repeat that one? Because I cannot, maybe I'll turn on the chat. Yes, it's in the chat. So the, the, the question is, is the Gar uh, Garson's method specific to machine learning or could it also um, uh, something like the Sobol in the uh, indices be applied? Do you know how they, they would compare? Yeah, I think the Garson's algorithm is specific to neural networks. So um, I, I am not sure aware of um, application to other machine learning techniques. Probably there can be something similar to other to other techniques, but this one is specific, I think, to, to neural networks. But they are often criticized for being black box models. And so, yeah, the interest was really to try to dig a little bit more into the model, not only getting the results of the global model, but trying to understand the effect of the different variables. And there were many that were considered in this study. Um, I can leave you a few references later on if, uh, about the algorithm and um, yeah, if there's interest. Fantastic. Um, next question is about uh, optimal density for emission uh, reduction. Do, do, do we have some insights from, from your work on um, what's the optimal density for emission reduction in general uh, in Portugal or uh, more generally? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I don't think we can never get an optimal city in the sense that, yeah, we cannot optimize a city. City is also, um, uh, we cannot optimize a city for energy and sustainability because it should also be optimized for, for other aspects, so, so social equity, etc. So I think, um, yeah, that's too topical. But, um, but in terms of sustainability and uh, minimizing energy, uh, minimizing energy consumption and uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, I think we can also not have a formula uh, or a recipe for, for, for all cities together. And that's why I, was, I mentioned I was interested in understanding, uh, try to apply this to more cities, understanding typologies, because from, from these typologies, maybe we can draw and generalize a little bit. Uh, based on, on, say, common aspects between different cities in different geographies. But I don't think we can get a recipe that applies to, to every city in the world. And one of the interesting facts from this research is that Porto and Lisbon are, you know, relatively uh, similarly in terms of climate. They are from the same country. So, um, but they led to completely different results. They, they have completely different dynamics um, internally. Um, not only in terms of construction, but also in terms of the transport network and travel behavior. So, um, yeah, two cities from the same country led to, to completely different results. I don't think we can generalize very much. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, we have a few questions um, related to um, how, can, how can we make this, uh, this, this AI approach for urban planning uh, more human-centric to the extent that, uh, like, we are using AI algorithms that are optimizing for certain metrics that can be uh, sustainability metrics, but how can we um, actually go further and um, incorporate, for example, a citizen feedback or participation in the uh, planning process and yeah, make, make the process more human-centric in a way? Yeah, that's also something that I, I would like to explore. Um, and uh, probably adding a few more dimensions into the model. Um, either by removing uh, some related to energy or try to just test the, the artificial intelligence uh, capabilities at the moment and just uh, increase, um, improve the models by adding social and uh, even economic uh, variables. I think it would be very interesting to, to try to uh, make, especially now that we're talking about just energy, energy transitions as well uh, in urban contexts to um, so we want to transition into some into a new realities that are sustainable, that are low carbon, but also that uh, everyone, no one is left behind, right? So, um, so I think that's also a very interesting uh, field of research, and uh, the model could benefit from adding new variables uh, more related to the social dimension. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah. Then uh, we have the, the direct answer to this, uh, uh, Stefano was the question is that, that we need more uh, computing power like uh, HPC. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, great, so I, I wanted to use the, the last oh. minutes of, of the, this webinar to have a joint discussion uh, between, uh, between all of us, uh, um, Mathilda, uh, Jason and, and Tao, and wanted to ask some uh, so some general questions on, um, yeah, on, on your experience. And I, I wanted to ask a first question and everybody please feel free uh, to also send some, some more questions for all the all three speakers. And so, I, I, so in the end, all this research is, um, is uh, useful to influence uh, planning processes and, and policy, right? And so I wanted to ask uh, you this first general question on what's your experience on how to translate insights the analysis to policy implementation and uh, whether you, you could notice some effects of that and, and what was the, the potential relationship with uh, policymakers that you, that you could have in the past? Uh, maybe I can start. And 
I think this is a very good question. You know, definitely, you know, we want to, you know, transform our research into the practice. And uh, apparently, for example, we use the data from the Twin City area and then we can offer direct evidence for the uh, uh, planners and uh, policymakers in the region. But I'm thinking about kind of the broader field. So that's the reason, you know, I'm, I hope, you know, we can see more studies in different cities and different countries. And then, so in that case, we can see whether or not, you know, we can gener generalize the result, or maybe even we can find a range. So that means when we try to come up with uh, uh, a development guideline. So, you know, in that guideline, you know, the, you know, for example, we, we can recommend the flower ratio of 2.0 or 3.0. So this is really kind of the, uh, the evidence-based recommendation instead of just kind of the brainstorming, right? So I think, you know, this is still going to be a long way to go. Yeah, because, you know, I think, you know, planners have some general sense about, for example, you know, this kind of variable is going to have a positive or negative influence on the carbon emission, but exactly, you know, what, what kind of shape or where is the threshold, you know, this is something, you know, still kind of the empirical and also is kind of contextual. Right. Mafalda, did you have some some interaction with the city of Porto or uh, Lisbon? Um, okay, maybe maybe, maybe not. Um, so I um, have some next questions. Um, yeah, so the. Uh, the, the studies that, that we've been looking at uh, in, in, this, in this webinar have been, uh, yeah, mostly focused in uh, North America and, and Europe. Um, and well, obviously, uh, there's a lot of, um, of change to do in, in, in cities on the, these two regions uh, to uh, get to, to, to low carbon cities. Um, but uh, we also have a, a very a, a substantial um, challenges with uh, um, new cities in the uh, like uh, new fast urban urbanizing cities in, in low income countries where uh, potentially the data, data situation is is not the same and so I was wondering um, what was your um, your opinion on what what can be done um, to help these cities um, also uh, find early um, uh, options for um, for developing their cities and not having like potentially a path dependency with uh, with certain planning solutions. So uh, ma making sure that um, yeah we we can um, provide some insights also to these cities. So I think uh, you know th there is always a challenge you know to bring about you know the uh, the data from the uh, developing countries and then focusing on uh, those areas because I think it's very important, right? You know, even we make a lot of changes in the developed country and then the reduction in terms of carbon emission is not allowed compared to the growth of the developing country. So I think, you know, if we can understand the connections uh, in the developing country and then that's going to help uh, reduce the carbon emission a lot. But we definitely, we see, you know, one part is about the data availability because, you know, they, they don't have the funding as they don't have the, you know, maybe this is not their priority. And then, you know, even though, you know, for the uh, scholars, or maybe, you know, they are not well trained in terms of the, this kind of research. Um, so, you know, the, we, I will see, you know, just kind of multiple factors will contribute to this deficiency. So that's reason something, you know, for example, the transformation research part D, we are trying to push towards that direction. For example, recently, you know, we, uh, issued a, for, a few call for papers, for example, you know, the TOD in Global South, and then uh, creating bicycle friendly city in the Global South. So, you know, we are trying to motivate researchers either, you know, collecting data from different countries. Also, you know, we try to uh, encourage the collaborations between uh, the developed country researchers and developed country researchers and hopefully you know we can gain some insights about that area and also we can provide some solid recommendation for their urban development right uh Afala, can you speak now and uh i seem to to be able to yes terribly perfect. sorry about no worries so uh yes yeah. went down yes <laughs> Um, any insights on the uh, dialogue with, with uh, local policymakers on or your thoughts on uh, how to help uh, also not only cities from the, the global north but from the global south um, with some insights? 
Sorry, I may have missed a little bit of the, the previous discussion, so. Um, yeah, so I was, um, I was asking that, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the work that uh, you've been doing is, is aiming to, um, to inform policymakers on, in the yes. end, uh, doing some, some uh, implementing some strategies. So uh, has this been, uh, is there been some, some dialogue uh, after this works? Yeah. So the, what, what I included in the strategic level was um, from, the, so from the identification of the urban development pathways that would make sense to pursue in the different case studies, um, how to get there. So basically, um, I tried to look at the policy mechanisms and the measures that should be implemented in order to, at the local level, of course, that, uh, that uh, would make sense to, to be implemented. Um, but I didn't involve, um, I didn't involve the stakeholder, local stakeholders directly at the moment. Um, yeah, that would be extremely interesting, in fact, to, to first for raising awareness and then to try to understand also in terms of policy making, what, what would be feasible, what would work best given the, the priorities, etc. cetera. But, um, but it was not possible given the short time frame of, of the project. It was left towards the end, of course, of the research and there was no, no time to, to do that. Great. We have a Felix, uh, question from Felix uh, Kratzig. I think, Felix, you can un unmute yourself. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Great presentation. It was very interesting to hear. Um, thanks a lot. <clears throat> I'm, I'm asking on, I think Mafalda already commented on that. I would like to continue the conversation on generalization on terms of like how much the framework is scalable. So how much you can spread to other cities. And it's very clear you always need local features. But it's also the capability of uh, deep learning that you can actually go to some generalization, which is so you can transfer something. And mm -hmm. also with respect to developing a platform that is really useful, useful for cities for planning, like in terms of that it's an easy to access uh, data platform. Um, so um, I'm wondering about how you see the potential and the barriers to that. Yeah. Well. Uh of course, when I applied this, this technique, I was interested in the generalization um, dimension of neural networks and the, that capability. Uh, but when I applied the, model, the, the modeling framework, uh, the methodological framework to different case studies, uh, the thing is that the model learns from the, so it has a learning process and it learns from the, from the case study uh, cases. Um, so maybe it could be interesting to try to apply the Porto model to, to Lisbon and see what would be the, um, the prediction power and try to see if it's very different from the Lisbon model and, and vice versa. Um, but uh, because there are many contextual uh, aspects, you know, to, to the urban form variables and even to the, um, to the energy consumption patterns, uh, I just, well, I replicated the, the methodological framework, but I didn't um, uh, test how each of the models will work in the different case studies. That would be, in fact, something interesting to do. Um, so, yeah. sorry. <laughs> um, that would be, in fact, something interesting to do. Uh, for, for instance, when we don't have uh, data resolution at the level that, uh, that we want for us in different geographies and try to see if a model that was developed somewhere else would work, that would be definitely something that uh, we could try to do in the future. Yes, very interesting. Um, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well. Uh, I think we're getting late here in Europe, uh, close to weekend. So actually, um, uh, I will uh, propose to uh, stop here. And uh, thank you again so much, uh, Mafalda, uh, Jason, and Tao uh, for uh, speaking, and everybody else for attending. And also a uh, big thank you to our uh, webinar team at CCI, uh, Marek and, and Felipe, for the, the great preparation work uh, of this uh, webinar. So yeah. Thank you so much again, everyone. And yeah, hope to see a lot of great new work in the intersection between urban planning and uh, machine learning for uh, more sustainable and resilient cities. And yeah, I wish everyone a great weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you.
Hi, thank you.